Great. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Welcome and thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this important event. My name is Susan Chomba. I'm the director of Vital Landscapes at WRI, World Resources Institute, based here in Africa. I'm also the global ambassador for the Race to Resilience and Race to Zero. I'm thrilled to be your moderator today and really, really grateful again for taking your time to join us. The goal of today's session is to advance locally led adaptation. Around the world, we are seeing growing recognition of the importance of locally led adaptation. Today, we are going to discuss what it actually looks like to ensure that finance and decision-making processes are really reaching communities on the front lines and how we can learn from existing models and work together towards scaling and supporting locally led adaptation. After we hear from our distinguished speakers, we have a brief presentation on the global movement for locally led adaptation. And then we'll have to hear from four organizations who are doing actual work of locally of driving locally led adaptation on the ground. Throughout the program, you as a participant will have the opportunity to contribute to the discussions and pose questions via the chat box, as well as the via Mentimeter, where we'll be projecting some polls for you to be able to participate. We will introduce that later. We'll also aim to leave some time for open Q and A question and discussions. A few quick uh, housekeeping notes before we kick it off. Please note this session is being recorded. We have French translation as you've heard. So in case you need to listen to the messages in French, please click on the globe icon and be able to follow the transactions in French. Kindly keep yourselves muted when you're not speaking. Thank you again for being here for this critical discussion. I have the pleasure now of introducing our first speaker, Hugh Davis, Deputy Director in the UK COP26 unit to give us the opening remarks. Hugh, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, good morning, friends and colleagues. It's a real pleasure to be here today speaking at the first of these regional dialogues on locally led adaptation. Um, as Susan said, I'm Deputy Director in, in the COP26 team, um, responsible for adaptation, resilience, loss and damage, um, and a range of other important issues, including uh, gender and, uh, and, and oceans. I work across the negotiations, but also on, on the campaigns we've been using to try and make some of these important issues more prominent uh, and more part of our work, give those issues a platform in the run up to COP26 in Glasgow. I mean, we've known, this community has known for a long time that local knowledge and solutions are essential to successful adaptation and enabling inclusive locally led adaptation is a critical part of what we as a presidency are seeking to catalyze to continue through to the African presidency at COP27 and beyond. And the principles for locally led adaptation provide a framework for how adaptation can be delivered more effectively. We must work together to determine how we integrate these principles into our decision making and implementation processes so that marginalized people and communities as critical agents for changes are empowered to plan for and protect their own future and finance is accessible for those who need it most. All sectors of society, including local and national government, businesses and civil society, multilateral development banks and climate funds must work together to share knowledge and support progress at all levels. In supporting the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience Programme, Life AR, the UK recognises that countries and local communities are the experts in informing the decisions on how to prepare for climate change in their own context and they should have the autonomy to make informed decisions on building their resilience. With Fiji and other partners, the UK presidency launched the Task Force on Access to Climate Finance to align programmatic support behind national climate plans to improve local level financial flows, which we know is absolutely crucial in this area. A set of principles under the Task Force on Access to Climate Finance will be developed and published to underpin and guide the new approach before COP with climate providers encouraged to sign. And we are encouraging the adaptation research community to endorse the research principles to carry out action-orientated research that responds to local needs. 
The Adaptation Research Alliance is seeking to catalyze action-oriented research, strengthening collaboration between Southern-led local universities and research institutes to enhance capacity building. Ahead of COP26, the UN General Assembly later this month and the Italian-led pre-COP in October provide key opportunities for highlighting the importance of locally-led adaptation and the progress which is being made by donors and the international community, including through the Task Force on Access and Life AR. In making locally-led adaptation a central priority for the COP26 presidency, we not only want to amplify the calls for greater support for locally-led action, but to also address the barriers that restrict and prevent finance flowing to the local level. We want to carry momentum into the African COP27 presidency with adaptation and loss and damage a priority for developing and developed countries alike. I look forward to hearing the outputs of what I'm sure will be a rich conversation today and continuing to work together to take collective action on this crucial agenda to COP26 and beyond. And one last comment, and I am conscious that this um, this is being interpreted for French as well. I possibly will be available from the team afterwards uh, if that's helpful to anyone. Now back to you, Susan. Thank you very much for having me here today. Brilliant. Thank you so much, you. And how wonderful to see locally led adaptation being prioritized in the upcoming COP26 and the COP26 COP presidency, the UK government. You've really highlighted key issues there around uh, community building, community autonomy, and really making this a locally led, a community led initiative in terms of local led, led adaptation. But also you've highlight, highlighted aspects around research, finance, as well as addressing other barriers, uh, policy and other barriers for locally led adaptation. That, so that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Hugh. I'm now pleased to introduce our keynote, another keynote speaker, Mamadou Honadia. Mamadou is the advisor to the chair of the LDC group of UNFCCC and senior climate negotiator for Burkina Faso and deeply steeped in the uh, uh, locally led adaptation discussions. So thank you so much, Mamadou, and over to you. Madam, I thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Greeting from Burkina Faso. My name is Mamadou, as you said. I started with negotiations by uh, trying to championing uh, adaptation as well as capacity building. And during the, the last uh, seven, eight years, uh, I'm working on, uh, on finance. It's really uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to these important, uh, these important discussions on scaling up locally led adaptation. Let me begin, begin by thanking uh, the Adaptation Action Coalition the UN high level champions and the race to resilience for presenting these dialogues in the road to COP26. I also acknowledge the organizations involved in delivering today's dialogue in the African region, being South South North, SLUM and SHIC, Dwellers International, and the the International Institute for Environment and Development, and the World Resource Institute and other sponsors. And I warmly also welcome all our speakers and case study presenters who are part of today's discussions. All around the world, people, communities, and countries are dealing with multiple shocks from climate change loss of nature and COVID-19 related impact. No one is immune from this crisis, but Africa regions is among the worst hurt by this impact. Our populations are particularly vulnerable to disproportionately impacted. So when this crisis hit our shores, they hit us hard, I may say very hard, both climate change and loss of nature and COVID-19 are exacerbating existing challenges, setting back sustainable development effort. We recognize that business as usual approaches to deal with climate crisis are not working in our countries. Already even at 
just one degree Celsius of warming, the impact are devastating. If we cannot limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, as agreed in Paris, the impact will rapidly increase. I have said this countless time, but I would stress again that adaptation is critical for us, not optional. And our priority is to improve our ability to adapt to the effect of climate change and build resilience to climate shocks. For this, there is a need to scale up adaptation finance for developing countries to meet the needs of the most vulnerable. We also need to build our local and national institutional capacity to strengthen our local and traditional knowledge and technology to adapt to adverse impact of climate change. Yes, too little climate finance flow directly to, Afri to our African national and local actors. This is unacceptable. Those in the poorest countries on the front line of climate change are not receiving the support they need to survive. If this continues, we will fall to address the climate crisis. For example, of the GCF portfolio, 81% of the total funding is international led, 81%. Clearly, things need to change. We have talked a lot. Let's go, let us go into action. More financial resources are needed for local governments, communities, enterprises, and actors working at the local level to implement their own climate solution. To tackle these challenges, the LDC group have stepped forward. We launch our long-term 2050 vision at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019. This vision is for LDCs to be on climate resilient development pathway by 2030 and deliver net zero emission by 2050 to ensure our societies, economies, and ecosystem thrives. Our vision is not an empty statement. LDC-led initiatives are already delivering on this vision. For example, the LDC Initiative on Adaptation and Resilience Life IR aims for 70% of climate finance to reach local level by 2030. Burkina Faso, like other front runner LDCs, have already started the process to formulate a long term strategy on adaptation and resilience. We are looking forward to seeing much more support and sponsors in this area. Fortunately, we know there is a fantastic innovation taking place across Africa in delivering climate finance to the local level. UNCDF is also another example of this. And I'm looking forward to hearing from them and the journey today and how the donors can respond to deliver more of their climate finance through these national and local approaches to get climate finance to the front lines. You will hear more about these principles for locally led adaptation shortly. And I'm inspired by the momentum they are generating. These principles, including the focus in increasing, in increasing resources at the local level, providing patient and predictable funding and investing in local capabilities are serious and meaningful response to the LDCs ask of the international community in our vision. I really urge you to take this principle seriously 
and to learn from case studies today that demonstrate this principle in action. I congratulate more than 50 organizations and governments that have signed up to a principle already. Now is the time to scale up locally led effort to support adaptation and resilience. This is a critical element of our society when shocks hit. As we get closer to COP26, I encourage everyone to use the principles as a way to inspire and improve practices in your organization to enable local action led by the most vulnerable communities. This change is hard, but it's worth, it's worth it for a brighter and better future. I wish you all a fruitful discussion today, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes of our discussions. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mamadou, for such insightful remarks in your keynote address. You've reminded us again about the critical role of locally led adaptation and some of the work that the LDC team is doing, including ensuring at least 70% of locally led finance um, or finance for locally led adaptation actually reaches the local level. You've also reminded us about the importance of the principles for locally led adaptation, which we are all extremely eager to hear for those who've not heard about them and learn more about them in the next session. So thank you so much. Those were excellent and we truly, truly appreciate. Now I'm going to hand over to the Menti team shortly and then come back. So Menti team, please. Thanks. Karen or Marek, if you yeah, can hear so, me. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Susan. So um, uh, we are going to do uh, use try using Mentimeter for this dialogue. And I think uh, Karen has just posted the link into the chat box. And you can also answer these questions by going on menti.com on your phone or your laptop, whichever device you're connecting on. Um, and just popping in this uh, eight digit code, which is 58816457. So we're going to be using this throughout the dialogue, but just to kick things off into a few icebreakers, just to get everyone discussing, uh, we're just going to ask a few questions. So if you log on to Menti, you can see these questions coming through. And I think I'm going to share my screen with, if I swap to Karen, we can allow Karen to share her screen. She'll be able to see, um, share these um, questions on uh from her side all right um there we go can you see my screen now Thanks, yes Karen. we yeah, can and we can see the countries coming in where people are all the cities we can see you Yes, Karen, please proceed. I was just saying we can see the screen. Wonderful. Um, so we, we have a wonderful diversity of countries, um, sectors, research, urban informality, climate change, agriculture. Wonderful to see the diversity of sectors that are uh, represented here. The issues, uh, what issues do you work on? Um, a lot of people working on adaptation, stakeholder engagement, finance, NBS. Um, it's great to hear that most of the participants, most of the people that are joining today have heard before of the principles for local led adaptation before, 17 um, participants. It's changing now. Um, what is your level of experience with locally led adaptation? Um, I have some experience. I am here to learn. It's changing rapidly to I have, I have some experience.
And it, you can move backwards and forwards using um, the arrow. So please feel free to um, uh, go back to questions that you, you would like to answer later. Um, or do you want to add additional information? We will have some open-ended comments, uh, open-ended questions later. So thank you everyone for joining and um, back to, to you, Susan. Wow, what a diverse mix of participants and diverse mix of experiences. And, um, and, and also in terms of what's happening there, people's experience with locally led adaptation, quite uh, impressive in terms of the number of people who are already familiar with the principles. But for those who are not familiar with them, I want to hand over now to Marek, Marek from the International Institute of Environment and Development. Marek, please take over and we are so eager with your, to hear from you on this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, just before I start, I did post the code in the chat again. Apologies for those asking. I was trying to do it and I couldn't seem to navigate my screen, but it now seems to be working. So thank you so much, Susan. And thank you all for those who have joined. Uh, so I'm, as Susan introduced, I'm Marek Soans from the International Institute for Environment Development. And I've been, I've been uh, working with uh, all 10 organizations that are part, uh, collaborating as part of this project, Scaling Up Local Led Adaptation, in collaboration with the COP26 presidency, the Adaptation Action Coalition, and Race to Resilience. So I'm just going to, uh, next slide, please. I'm just going to take you through a bit of a, a context setting on why we believe local led adaptation is so important, um, uh, what uh, political changes and movements are happening as part of local led adaptation, which were introduced by Hugh and by Mamadou at the beginning, and a bit of context for the stories that we're about to hear. So firstly, what, what is local led adaptation? So I think we'd all collectively agree that adaptation should be benefiting local communities, individuals, organisations who are at the front line of climate change. We'd all agree that they're the ones who need to be benefiting most from climate, uh, from climate change adaptation. Um, but when we're talking about local led adaptation, we're talking about something where we're giving more power and agency to those local organisations, local actors, individuals, to actually lead their own ad adaptation, to prioritise, design, implement, monitor and evaluate the solutions that work for them most. And therefore, more power and resources is flowing to local actors and individuals and households that are better placed to facilitate local led adaptation, whether that be local civil society organizations that represent excluded people and groups and provide people centered solutions. It could be public sector actors such as local government authorities responsible for meeting local needs and delivering public services. It could be private sector organizations at the local level, both formal and informal represented smallholders local companies, cooperatives, financial institutions that are the backbone of driving economic growth in a country or region. Next slide, please, Emily. So we need more local led adaptation because we're dealing with this triple crisis of climate biodiversity and inequality that's felt most by the poor and most excluded. And households are already spending by far the most on adapting and responding to disasters. Yet we um, have a situation where too little climate finance and development and humanitarian finance is flowing to local actors. For instance, we know that less than 10% of global climate fund finance is being dedicated to local action. And we have a failure in the humanitarian community also with the grand bargain aim of 25% of humanitarian finance to flow to local responders, only being at 2.5% over the last couple of years. And the reality is that most climate adaptation finance is of poor quality. It's highly intermediated, as Mamadou introduced. The vast majority, for instance, of the Green Climate Fund flows through international organizations. It's often, therefore, highly top down, designed in distant headquarters, often uh, is incapable of building uh, institutions at the national and local level. It often leads to short term projects with helicoptered in solutions uh, with little focus on addressing the root causes or structural causes of vulnerability or addressing the long term climate risks that communities face. Next slide, please. Fortunately, we've had a growing political movement on the need for local led adaptation. As has been already introduced, the least developed countries are showing global leadership committing to deliver 70% of their climate finance to the local level by 2030 as part of their least developed countries initiative for effective adaptation and resilience. And we've had the growing political momentum around adaptation as part of the Global Commission on Adaptation. And it had a local action track championed by commissioners Sheila Patel from Slum and Shakdwala's International, 
and Dr. Mohamed Musa from BRAC International, really trying to galvanize increased political recognition and funding support for local action. And more recently, the COP26 presidency, Alok Sharma, has stated the importance of local-led adaptation coming out of the climate and development ministerial. And the G7 has welcomed the eight principles for local-led adaptation, which I'll go through in a moment. And the Race to Resilience is trying to integrate local-led adaptation across the initiatives that it's supporting. But accompanied by this agenda is a clear, strong ask from the world's most vulnerable countries, the least developed countries, and particularly the small island developing states, to marry this agenda on increasing local-led adaptation, but also access to finance, recognizing that increasing the access by national and local organizations to climate finance is essential for delivering better climate adaptation resilience, especially at the local level. Next slide, please, Ebony. So what are these eight principles that you've heard about so far? These eight principles have been developed over the past four to five years over a whole range of research from many organizations, including IID, the World Resources Institute, ECAD, SDI, Guaro Commission, and many other organizations. I think over 50 organizations collaboratively took part in them over the course of their development. And these were launched at the Climate Adaptation Summit hosted in January 2021. And these include devolving greater decision making on adaptation to the lowest appropriate level. Put putting addressing the structural causes of inequality, particularly faced by women, youth, children, disabled, displaced, indigenous peoples, and other marginalized ethnic groups at the heart of delivering, delivering adaptation solutions. Providing patient and predictable funding that is aligned with how to deliver adaptation, recognizing that delivering transformative change takes 10 years or more, not just a couple of years that projects are often designed around. And we need to invest in, the, in sustainable institutions, leaving institutional legacies at the local level. At the end of the day, it's local and national organizations that are going to ensure adaptation takes place sustainably over time. We need to build a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty that builds upon and champions traditional indigenous and generational knowledge that has been working around and building upon uncertain solutions for decades and millennia. Flexible, uh, we need to deliver flexible and uh, programming and adaptation focus around learning, recognizing that adaptation is inherently a learning approach. We don't know perfect solutions from the get-go. We need to design iteratively what solutions are best for different communities. And we need to show ensure transparent and accountable solutions, enabling communities to uh, understand what adaptation is taking place in their landscape, in their jurisdiction, what policies and procedures they can engage with to deliver adaptation solutions which work for them. And finally, to deliver collaborative action and investment, recognizing we need to collaborate across humanitarian development and humanitarian and climate investments, but also across uh, different levels of government from national to regional to local and across the private civil society and public sectors. Next slide, please, Ebony. And as has been already introduced, we have a growing number of endorsements to these principles. Around 55, if not over, organizations have now endorsed these principles, ranging from the UK government through FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, to major climate funds like the Adaptation Fund or the, climate, the GEF, to major UN agencies like UNDP, to international, um, the World Wildlife Federation, or the United Nations Capital Development Fund and also Southern-based NGOs, such as Canary based in the Caribbean. Huge range of organizations have endorsed. And we really hope you will join, in our, join us on this journey and join the community of practice that is growing a meeting to understand how to deliver adaptation effectively at the local level and put more power and resources into the hands of local organizations and individuals and communities. Next slide, please. So this uh, dialogue is really focused, as has been introduced, on understanding how to deliver climate finance behind local priorities and to the local level. Now, some of the case studies you're going to hear from later today are really focused around the concept that we already have many existing institutions and mechanisms that are ready made to deliver climate finance to the local level. We don't often need to develop entirely new approaches. We have things like decentralization driven by uh, governments. We have civil society organizations that have been supporting ecosystem management and supporting the needs of the poorest and most vulnerable for decades. We have local enterprises that are supporting the economic backbone and can be supported to access and deliver more innovative solutions. So what we need to understand is what approaches we should be really channeling climate finance through, doing things in a business unusual way, so we can effectively manage and access finance directly to the local level, manage funding for climate change more exclusively, 
involving local organisations and local actors, especially most excluded in these decisions, provide climate informed advice, enable rapid learning and embed these within institutions that can deliver sustainable adaptation over time. Next slide, please. So this dialogue series is, as I said, really part of understanding what these approaches are. With the, gale, the goal of scaling up state and non-state approaches for financing and governing and delivering local-led adaptation, understanding what are the pathways we, uh, we can collectively work on to replicate and scale up some of these approaches across the Asia Pacific, Africa, the Caribbean and Latin America. And this dialogue is the first in the Africa dialogue series, um, which will take, be taking place all this week across other regions and then again in October to really uh, facilitating what are the approaches that exist, facilitating learning to happen, not only within regions, but across regions, and really understanding what are the really effective approaches across non-state and state actors, public, private, and civil society, for delivering climate finance to the local level, behind local priorities in an inclusive way, is really governing uh, adaptation effectively on the, into the long term. And next slide, please. So what have we been doing over the past couple of months? Well, you're about to hear from four fantastic case studies, but we've been collectively capturing or across the 10 organisations involved, um, nearly almost 100 examples of uh, cases that can be delivering climate finance behind the priorities of the most excluded poor people at the local level. These include uh, examples such as decent adaptive decentralisation, which we'll hear about today, examples of using social protection to deliver adaptation, Example of granting mechanisms, delivering grants to civil society, to local government, on lending and credit lines to local governments and households. Examples of indigenous peoples led uh, funding mechanisms, uh, women's led funding mechanisms, those in, involving greater youth and child, children engagement. We've collected a whole range of fantastic examples, but these are just the examples we know of across the partners involved. And we will be showcasing some of those today across the Africa region and across the rest of this week. But we really, really hope this dialogue will facilitate yourselves adding to this great portfolio of examples. We hope to add some further pins on this map of all the different approaches that exist across the globe for delivering climate finance at the local level. So we can make a collective call to the international climate funds, to donors to say that it's no longer good enough to deliver funding just through international organisations, that there are a whole range of national and local organisations that can be delivering climate finance much more effectively to the local level in an effective and sustainable and inclusive way. I think that's the end. I think we have some time for some questions, if there is any questions from the audience. And um, so again, if you go use on to menti.com or uh, if you want to put your questions in the chat, we can do that also. So yeah, so menti.com using the code code 58816457, or you can take a screenshot of this QR code on the screen, or you can pop your questions in the chat if that's not working. And our colleague Karen will be managing those questions that are popping up. And I think if someone could also pop in the um, link into the uh, chat to allow people to observe the questions that are popping up as well, that would be fantastic. Um, so yeah, if anyone has a question, please do fire away. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, I think that that has been a fantastic presentation. We all know now uh, what are the eight principles of locally led adaptation. Thank you, Marek. Um, now, we still have a bit of time for this session. So as Marek mentioned, we are very eager to know. We can see, I can see in the chats are coming fast and furious. If you have a question, a burning question, please put it in the in the chat and we'll pick it and direct it to the speakers who've already spoken. So before we go to the case studies where we'll be diving deep on some ex excellent case studies in Africa, we do want to hear from you. Uh, type your question, type your comment in the chat box and we'll select one of those or a few of those to be uh, shared with the presenters that have managed to speak so far. Brilliant. Um, and as mentioned, we also have the Mentimeter question. So question, uh, uh, the, the question about locally led adaptation. Uh, we really, really want you to go to the Mentimeter as well and uh, put those questions, answer those questions through the Mentimeter. As we are waiting for your questions to come in, um, the map that, um, that Marek just showed, Marek, if, 
if you're still on that and could you please project that map it really was quite yes exactly thank you so much this map is quite telling in terms of uh, the range and examples of locally led adaptations that we see happening all over the world but also across africa the african continent so in if you look at them there are some areas where you're seeing you know a lot of concentration of, of locally led adaptation i'm sure probably there are a few others that have not been captured but we do want to see this you know sort of um locally led ad adaptations cutting across the entire continent because it's not just about some regions where you have vulnerability I think some of the areas you can see the um, the southern part of Africa, the middle part, Chad, Nigeria, Niger, and those countries, not a lot happening, and especially in the north. So we do want to catalyze locally led adaptation across other areas, across the countries, and where they've not been captured, of course, we do want to have that captured in our geographies in on the continent. So I'm now going to move in the chat box, I'm waiting to see there's a question coming from the Menti. Karen, would you like to um, mention the, the question in the Menti, Karen? Sure. <clears throat> um, the question is, uh, will governments accept channeling funds outside of government agencies, local government? And who's that question addressed to? Mm, there's no mention of, of who is this directed to. It's more okay. like a general question. And there's another one coming. Will the GCF be able to support locally led adaptation? That's a good okay, question. Okay, so if, if uh, Mamadou is still there, based on his experience with the LDC group and, and as well as being a negotiator from uh, Burkina Faso, the question is, will governments accept channeling of finances or financial flows through non-governmental organizations in the African countries. This is an African dialogue, so let's concentrate on that discussion right now. Mamadou, if you're still there, um, kindly do give us your, your, your take on that. Hello, excuse me. Yes. Can you hear me? I have tried to switch uh, from English to French and and back better really i mix up everything and uh, really i'm lost so i think i heard your <clears throat> your question uh, in africa it's not quite easy because there is a boundary between the public the private and the civil society organizations if financial flow let's go from a donor to the government, the government will use it for the public services, for the public programs and projects. Depending on the relationship between NGOs and private with the public, maybe 5%, not more than 10% could be shared with them. To me, uh, it will be very relevant to have a specific channel for the financial flow for the international level to the local communities or to the private sector. Unless there is a sort of a memorandum of understanding which can provide a sort of measures and, uh, uh, how I call it, and, gui and guidance where the government must share X percent with NGOs, X, uh, Y percent with, uh, with the private sector. But definitely what I would have to say, there is a lack of dialogue between the public, the civil society organization and the, and the private sector. So in the area of finance, it's very sensitive, it's very crucial. And there is a need that we, we make our own work. I mean, within LDCs. This dialogue is very crucial as far as climate change is concerned. But I know actually the challenge we will be facing is to see international financial flow 
from that level to the grassroots level without any involvement of the government. Really, they will, they, they will wonder what's, up, what's happening in the country. Because the government is the one who signed and ratify the conventions. So they would like to be involved in the process. We have to see uh, which, which window we will try to activate in order to involve the government, even if we decide what the financial flow for the international level to the grassroots level should be operated. So this is what I would like to share with you. I don't know if I heard very well, very well your, your, your question. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mamadou. I think we've gotten your insights very clearly and for sure, um, you know, trying to define the clarity in terms of financial flows between different stakeholders and especially knowing how um, when it comes to, uh, you know, locally led adaptation, it's decentralized actions, they happen at the local level. So it's not just about national government, it's also sub-national and local governments and therefore thinking about the relationships and financial flows between government, uh, private sector actors, as well as uh, civil society organizations and local community groups is going to be crucial. Thank you so much, we've received that. So the second question, I will direct it to Marek. Marek, will GCF be able to support um, locally led adaptation? Marek. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, so actually the um, idea of running, part of running this dialogue is really inspired in part by the challenge that many of you will be observing at the Green Climate Fund in their facility to try and support local led adaptation, which is called Enhanced Direct Access, which if, if with many of you that may follow the GCF, you will see that it's not doing too well. Uh, I think there are two uh, programs that have accessed the 200 million that was set aside for Enhanced Direct Access programs. And the whole idea today is to really showcase to institutions like the Green Climate Fund that there are all these approaches that could offer huge opportunities to deliver climate finance to the local level. And international organizations that dominate the funds like the Green Climate Fund, uh, I think Mamadou mentioned it's over 80% of the funding from the Green Climate Fund is currently channeled through international accredited entities, not national or local accredited entities. And the idea is to really say look you need to be supporting many of these approaches these are ready made to deliver climate finance behind local priorities it is no longer good enough to say that there is lacking capacity or a lack of examples that can deliver funding effectively cost effectively sustainable to the local level because we can see here these are just the approaches we've mapped over a few months and many of you here today will be able to help fill this map even further and there are a whole lot of approaches so i would say our message is that the Green Climate Fund needs to take a note of all these approaches and work out how it can change its procedures, change its rules on international organisations and how they act to mentor all of these approaches to effectively deliver climate finance to the local level. And I think we will hear today from an example or a few examples that have managed to access international climate funds and maybe hear from some of the lessons in, of how they've managed to do so. I hope that answers a bit of that question. Thank you, Marek. And another question here before we move to the next session. Um, several international organizations have endorsed the principles of locally led adaptation, but in reality, these international organizations compete with national and local institutions for funding and influence. How do we address this? How do we address this very, very complex challenge here of yes, the international organizations competing for funding and influence with local organizations. I'm not sure who to direct this question to. I want to take it back to the IED team and uh, WRI teams, the organizers of this event with me. And please, um, let me first of all, just throw it to Christina. Christina, if you're there, kindly guide us on how to address this question and whether we can be able to think through it because I think it's critical the listeners know that complex dynamic of international organizations and local actors competing for funding and influence with, uh, together at the local level? Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. It is a complicated question and a good one to, to surface on these 
these dialogues because there is a, a tension between different organizations maybe working for the same ultimate goal, but in, in many ways competing with each other and competing with local organizations. And part of what we're trying to do with these principles is, is uh, really to subvert the, the paradigm where it's the international organizations that in some ways direct the agenda and direct the, the, the local institutions um, and, and have a more bottom-up process where local institutions are supported to bring their agendas forward, whether they're a civil society or local government, to bring their agendas forward up to the national government and the international sphere. And in fact, one of the, the core principles that, uh, that are articulated in the principles for locally led adaptation is building and supporting that, that local capacity um, over the long term and leaving strong local institutions. Uh, uh, and so I think as, as international organizations, we as WRI um, are committed to really looking at how we work um, how we work with local partners so that we're not subverting the power and directing um, institutions on what to do, but, but actually listening and supporting. Um, and I'm sure we won't get it right every time uh, because it is uh, a learning process for us all. Um, but I think it's, it's really important to, to really surface those, those issues. Um, I'll see if other colleagues uh, from, from across the organizing team want to address that uh, in, in the next minute or two that we have here. But thanks, Susan. No, that's absolutely brilliant, Christina. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time, I think that was quite a comprehensive response. Uh, in the interest of time, we want to, to move now to the case studies because we do want to see what's happening on the ground um, so, um, and just to remind you that throughout, you have access to the mentee, you can answer those questions anytime. So let's get and let's get now into the case studies. Um, sorry, it looks like I was muted. Um, we are now getting into the case study. I just wanted to say, remember, you have full access to the mentee meter throughout. Continue visiting and let's get into the case study now. So. In terms uh, for the case study number one, we are going to hear from South Africa Community Adaptation Small Grants Facility from Tammy Merrill. Uh, please, Tammy, take over. Thank you, Susan, so much for your introduction. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tammy Merrill from South South North. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the Community Adaptation Small Grants Facility, colloquially known as the SGF Project. The SGF Project implemented a grant-making mechanism using enhanced direct access to climate finance. It was the first EDA project funded by the Adaptation Fund, and it provided small grants to 12 local grant recipients, 4,000 hey, US dollars. Sorry, yes? sorry to interrupt a bit. Is it possible to put it in slideshow? Um, because we are seeing the entire set of slides. Just sorry for the interruption. I was just wondering whether it's possible to fix it quickly. And it, if it doesn't, then ignore and proceed. No, thank, thank you for that. It, I believe that's going to be better now. It's perfect, thank you. Thank, thank you, Susan, for acknowledging that. Um, the projects that we're discussing today were located in three areas in dark blue on the map. The Namaqua District of the Northern Cape Province in Western Cape, uh, the, in the Western, sorry, in the Northern Cape Province and the Western part of South Africa, and the Mopani District in Limpopo Province in the Northeast. Climate change projections for South Africa include increased frequency and intensity of weather events, heavily impacting those in Mopani District who depend on agricultural production for subsistence and livelihoods, and those in the Namakwa whose primary livelihoods are livestock farming and fishing. 
Note that the Namaqua population is about 100,000 people, while Mopani is about a million. The subsectors were determined through vulnerability assessments conducted in the regions, which noted that agriculture, livelihoods, and settlements were not only at high risk of climate impacts, but also determined as a priority by the communities themselves. Presented here is the project organogram. Getting money to local grant recipients required the support of many stakeholders. The Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries was the national designated authority, while the South African National Biodiversity Institute, SANBI, was the project grant recipient and dispersed all funds. Civil society, however, played were key enablers to ensure that small grant recipients were able to receive the funding and adequately implement their respective projects. As national implementing entity, SANBI had oversight and reporting responsibilities relating directly to the adaptation fund, and they subsequently distributed funds to the executing entity, South South North. Financial and technical due diligence rested with South South North, who coordinated and managed the granting process and distributed funds directly to facilitating agencies and the awarded grant recipients. Technical input and strategic direction during the grant application process and project implementation was supported by the project advisory group, which included the whole project management team and two municipalities. Facilitating agencies played a very important role, which I'll discuss in the next slide. And each of the facilitating agencies in each of the two regions developed their own technical advisory groups. And they also played a critical role in promoting locally led initiatives that were contextualized to the practical needs on the ground. In addition, this local support, particularly the, the support of the municipalities, increased project sustainability. So why was SGF business unusual? Well, for several reasons. The project governance structure integrated many stakeholders, and this facilitated access to expertise and information, uh, as well as support with some government processes. The beneficiaries at the community level were involved throughout the project. Proof needed to be provided that all beneficiaries approved of the project design and the activities and sustainability plans were often needed to be signed off by local leaders or cooperatives. Um, despite this, grant recipients did complain about onerous or cumbersome reporting requirements. Throughout the project, uh, a lot of attempts were made to be responsive to local needs. Alternative contracting mechanisms were arranged through tripartite agreements to ensure that more community-based organizations and cooperatives had access to the grant and customized training was provided as well as additional money for interventions. And the facilitating agencies they were a unique innovation playing a critical role in translating the global expectations of the adaptation fund and the monies associated with it into practicable measures on the ground. Um, each of the facilitating agencies had an existing footprint in their respective areas, understood local needs and provided considerable capacity building. We couldn't do adaptation in isolation. We had to incorporate development as well, and we had to justify it. So, but this approach recognized and articulated the differences between adaptation and development while acknowledging the community's priorities holistically. There was a lot of capacity building that took place throughout the life, lifespan of the project, and not only on adaptation technology and project implementation, but also financial management and grant management. And finally, formally facilitated events, as well as informal exchanges via WhatsApp groups formed 
these relationships help facilitate cross learning and in some cases projects added additional interventions based upon examples that they saw through these learnings. Although the SGF aligned with most of the principles in some way or another, the primary strengths were the devolved decision making and the inclusion of women and indigenous peoples. Part of the eligibility cr criteria was to ensure that indigenous peoples um, were included and that women not only benefited, but were involved in the project management structures. Gender and youth were disaggregated in all results. Each of the three investment windows, climate resilient livelihoods, climate smart agriculture, and climate proof settlements, uh, included a variety of interventions. And often those interventions were integrated to provide added value and improve sustainability. I'll quickly go through a couple of examples. This example, the Gantata Rainwater Harvesting System and Rain Gauge Project based in the Mopani District, sought to promote climate resilience through increased access to water and fodder for livestock and nutritious foods for community members. The installation of rainwater harvesting systems in 115 homes, the rehabilitation of local dams, and construction of gabions to reduce soil erosion sought to increase access to safe water and increase community resilience. 2,800 people benefited from this project. Another project, the Biodiversity and Meat Cooperative Land and Livestock Adaptation Project, based in the Namaqua district, aimed to introduce hardier indigenous livestock that were more resilient to heat and disease, grazed less selectively, and still fetched premium prices. This project focused on developing livestock management processes, including appropriate vaccinations, dipping, and medication of livestock. Over a thousand people in the Namaqua region benefited from this project. The SGF journey was a long one that ultimately lasted over five years. What we learned is that, is that a balance must be achieved between robust oversight structures and agile systems that are responsive to local needs. This requires a system that evolves with the needs of the project and ensures that beneficiaries remain central implementers and decision makers throughout. Responsive capacity building and applying a holistic approach is also required to ensure that EDA is not just a means, but that it facilitates the end result of resilient, healthy, and prosperous individuals and communities. Increased and accelerated adaptation funding is desperately needed to ensure that vulnerable, po vulnerable populations can not only thrive, not only survive, but thrive the impending climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tammy. What an excellent and clearly received message there. I have just one clarifying question for you, Tammy. Um, if you were to support other organizations um, to replicate your local funding model uh, or approach, what would be the key recommendations or lessons that you'd like to share? There would be many, but I think I'll start with just sort of the, the, the the most important. I think the first one is, is that that devolved decision making power. So the SGF did, I think, an extraordinary job of trying to develop a governance model that devolved decision making power. Although I think the next iteration should take that another step further. So there would there should be mechanisms that sort of feed back to the donor or at least the, the um, grant recipient to ensure that the voices on the ground are heard and are able and their lessons and their priorities are able to be fed back into the decision making processes so that so that the this governance system and the support and the associated funding can be agile and responsive. 
Um, I think that's one thing. Um, I think that we need to ensure we have time, which is another principle. So this project was a five-year project. Unfortunately, this was the first funded EDA project by the Adaptation Fund. It took us over two years just to get our governance structures together, the protocols in place. So by the time that the grants were awarded, they only had a year or two to implement, and it wasn't enough time. Adaptation takes time and ongoing support. Um, I think the other thing it would be capacity building. Capacity building is key, and not just with the local organizations. We're talking, we are all learning together. So even the high level organizations at, at national level are also learning and need to approach it from a perspective that, that we're learning together. We're co-creating and we're, we're a part of a journey together. And, and that's the capacity building at local level um, needs to be that not transactional, but co-creative. And then the final thing I'm gonna say is just that, you know, local level costs need to be understood, including the in-kind benefit from communities. I think we often think like, oh, but they live there, it's fine. Um, it, it actually is taking people's productive time and energy away from earning money or taking care of your kids to be involved in these community proper uh, projects and they need to be acknowledged and understood. And local NGOs can't absorb um, any costs. There's no absorptive opportunity for them just to say, okay, well, we're going to do these reports for free because the project is closed. Local CBOs have to have funding to be able to do all of the requirements of the project, um, including after closeout, audits, those kinds of things. So I hope I didn't go on. Those would be some really key lessons I think we learned from our project. Incredible, amazing. I do really, really love and resonate with those lessons, having also worked with local groups on the ground. You know, local communities' time is actually important and it is time that could be directed to other activities, even though adaptation is for them. It's still good to recognize, absolutely. And you've just summarized them so well, Tammy. I mean, we could go on with this discussion, but in the interest of time, let's get into the second case study. Thank you, thank you so much. That was absolutely terrific. Thank you. So the second case study, um, we are going to Kenya, my own country here, where we are going to hear from um, Malik Aman, Program Manager of the National Treasury of Kenya, and Victor Orindi, Coordinator of the Adaptation Consortium. So Marik, Malik and, um, and Victor, please take the stage. Uh, merci beaucoup, Aziz. Uh, Est-ce que tu m'écoutes? Ok, merci. Uh, je crois uh, the host would like to you to, to ok, je suis là, merci. Victor, if you can hear us, we are ready to proceed, please. Ja Oui, je n'ai pas je je le présentateur. Sorry, currently I'm hearing the translation back. I can't hear the presenter. Hello, can you hear me now? Excellent. Now I can hear you and we can see you, Victor. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for the small hiccup. Um, um, I'll make this beaucoup. presentation uh, on behalf of my colleague. Sorry, sorry, Victor, the translation, we can hear both Victor and the translation. Uh, sorry, the technical teams kindly just help us fix that so that we are only hearing Victor on the channel, on the English channel and only translation on the French channel. Let's try again, Victor. Okay, thank you. How is it going now? Now I'm, I can hear you only. Can you hear me only? <laughs> Okay, so I'll make this presentation on the County Climate Change Fund mechanism that has been piloted and being rolled out in Kenya for the benefit uh, of all the participants, mostly those who are from outside, just to say that uh, we are organizing in terms of uh, the national level and then 
the next level is the county level. In Kenya, we have a total of 47 counties. Below the counties, we have the sub-counties and then the ward level, which is our lowest planning unit. In terms of um, uh, the county climate change fund mechanism, I just want to say that this is uh, a mechanism designed uh, to channel uh, climate finance to the lowest level uh, to finance priority climate change interventions. Um, as you can see from the uh, diagram on the left, uh, it's designed to attract funding from both public and private sources, national, international, and also local sources, from example, the budgets. And uh, in terms of uh, planning how to use and make a decision on, on the use, we have the ward level committees at the lower level, uh, which uh, have a role of mobilizing the communities to identify and prioritize the interventions. They work together with the county level committees, which I'll come to shortly, uh, to see if they meet the pre-agreed criteria in terms of identifying what to invest in. And uh, as we've, uh, uh, the way we've employed, impl employed or uh, implemented this is that majority of the funding is dedicated to the lower level that's the ward where we have 70% of the total kitty, 20% catering for things like policy and building at the county level and restricting expenditure on administrative overheads. In terms of how the mechanism looks like or what consists of, it consists of uh, four components, four interrelated components that work to reinforce each other. I'll just explain this briefly. So the first component is a county fund, which is uh, uh, established through a county legislation um, used to finance priority climate change activities. As I've said, it's designed to attract funding from the public, that's through the budgeting process, private sector, donors, etc. etc. And uh, the key thing for us here is that county governments, which is our uh, subnational governments, also allocate a percent of their development budget each year to the kitty. Uh, typically, they have been allocating a minimum of 2%, 1 to 2%. Some are now doing 3 which is great. And this money is used based on the pre-agreed criteria to finance those interventions. Related to the committees is the, to the fund is the committees. We have committees at the lower level, which are actually the pillar of this mechanism at the ward level, the lowest planning unit, uh, that work uh, with communities uh, to identify what their challenges are, climate related challenges, uh, prioritize based on the valuable budget, which they know in advance um, uh, to invest in a particular year, and then share these or engage these with the county level committee that support them technically to ensure they meet the criteria and uh, finance those investments. The key thing for this mechanism is that the relationship between the lower level and the higher level at the county level is more facilitating rather than vetoing what's coming from the lower level. The third component being a climate change initiative is about the focus on climate information services and other tools that help us integrate both community and other forms of knowledge. Um, we have uh, our agencies, uh, the, the meteorological department, supporting the process of coming up with a, a strategy to provide um, tailored climate information to users at that lower level, so that this informs uh, the assessments that communities carry out, the prioritization, the design and location of investments. So this is to ensure that they deal with both current and also the future risk that uh, people are able to pick up. Um, I don't know why it's jumped. Sorry, something happened. Uh, it just jumped to the next slide. I don't know why. The other bit is about ensuring that we also uh, track what we are doing. In terms of um, um, where it started, uh, way back in 2010, under our then Ministry of Northern Kenya, which felt, and other lands, which felt that those areas were actually being impacted and the feeling was that they could not wait any longer. And therefore, the idea was to come up with something that could be tried and then uh, uh, integrated in the government planning system. So the work started way back in 2010. Uh, with participation of a number of agencies, international and local ones. Uh, later, apart from working in the initial county of Isiolo, we later, after stock taking, moved to additional four counties, 
with support of a number of development partners. But the key thing for us at that particular juncture was the fact that um, the was the fact that the the national uh, adaptation plan actually picked this up as a good lesson that was worth replicating. Uh, fast forward, uh, the fact that in our uh, new planning cycles, counties now legislated to ensure that this is properly institutionalized. We had rounds of investment, further rounds of investments, and also we took some time to learn from our mistakes and see how best this can be taken forward, especially in our national climate change action planning processes that's going on. And of course, uh, to date, where we have uh, Victor, also... sorry, sorry to interrupt, but um, I was hoping that you could be able to put the slides back in presentation mode. Yeah, kindly. I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, that better. from current slide, excellent. Yeah, yeah sorry about you. that. Um, so, what makes this sort of the business unusual? Though it was an initiative piloted by a number of actors, I think the decision to ensure that uh, we look at the current the planning system that we had and see how best we can reform it uh, to ensure it respond to the challenges that we were facing at that particular moment and also going forward. So instead of piloting outside the government, we worked within the government uh, to ensure that we addresses the weaknesses with the planning at both lower level but also at the national level. The other bit is that uh, with the committees I've talked about the world level committees, these are the the cornerstone of the pillars of this mechanism, but they're elected by community members and they decide in terms of where to use their resources that have been allocated in a particular year. This one is giving us the opportunity to ensure that whatever is prioritized, whatever is invested in actually respond to the needs of the people, uh, the affected people, most of the marginalized groups that are usually left out in the process. Bringing on board government agencies, NGOs, both international and local uh, development partners also ensured that uh, we harnessed or harvested or benefited from their different knowledge, resources and capacities that I don't think would have been possible uh, with only maybe only government or only NGOs doing their work uh, separately. And uh, also the fact that uh, we are creating a fund, a mechanism that can pull funding from different sources also help us in ensuring that we have targeted and well-coordinated mechanism going forward. Achievements, so as I've said over 10 years going forward, we have the 15, uh, as at now we have 15 counties that has established the mechanism that consists of those four components. But the beauty of it is that uh, apart from the fact that they're institutionalized, we are seeing the ward committees, the communities who are uh, driving this process, engaging in the wider planning and the budgeting process. So they're not only influencing the climate change work, but the broader development work within the county. Of course, we have investment done with the resources that uh, we got from the development partners of the government, uh, ranging from the infrastructure type, we are largely working in arid and semi-arid areas, so most of them are on water, but we also have other ones like community radio for broadcasting climate information and other development information, livestock laboratory for uh, quicker and timely diagnosis of diseases, healthy livestock, we also worked on strengthening those customer institutions that we felt were very critical in ensuring that we manage our resources sustainably going forward. And of course, strategies and plans are also developed. The other key thing is that uh, this was new and therefore uh, documenting for the benefit of those who are coming or getting into the process, we thought also was very critical. So some photos there on your right. Um, uh, one of the important points I want to emphasize on this particular slide is uh, the picture uh, on the right, the, the water point, where you see uh, communities uh, decided to turn a challenge into a solution or to a benefit. This was a big rock which was channeling uh, rainwater into the community land, causing gullies heavy erosion, but they felt that if it was, uh, um, there was uh, an embankment or a barrier created, it could be, the water could be channeled into water tanks that can be used to supply water to homes uh, for different uses. So you see the benefit there. So how are we aligned with the, the locally led principle? So first it's about uh, devolution, which for us is critical in terms of decisions here, uh, actually being made at that lower level by community representative elected by the communities. 
Um, and therefore, what we are seeing is that uh, the investment are very um, relevant, pertinent to their issues. Of course, um, in terms of, uh, we've also tried in the design uh, and also in the legislation is recognized that you need to actually ensure that uh, the marginalized, the minorities are included in the process. Otherwise you not hear their voices. Uh, so that has been done, uh, but as you'll appreciate, some of these challenges are uh, deep-seated in society, in our cultures and practices, and therefore it's going to take a long time before they are actually dealt with adequately. So while we are doing that, I think a lot still needs to be done. We've had the advantage of uh, working on this, this for uh, some time, also taking time to reflect, distill learning and inform future development. And therefore, I think the beauty is that uh, we now appreciate why it's good to spend some good time uh, and get some funding to continue doing the, the work that you are doing. Additionally, the fact that what's in the kitty for a particular financial year help us in uh, terms of participation, decision making, and therefore they only work with what they think they can do and avoid generating long lists that are never acted upon. The other bit is about, uh, as I said, it's a, it was a consortium brought together. And uh, the key thing is that we are looking at what strength do the different institutions have, how can they support uh, the initiative and how can this be taken forward? We had uh, agencies concerned with the planning, uh, playing a critical role in terms of how to reform planning process. We had those dealing with climate information among others. The other bit is about uncertainty going forward as far as climate change is concerned and you'd appreciate that uh, with the, that challenge, then you need to adopt a staggered or a stepwise process where you can start small, take your lessons, strengthen the institutions based on the need that is realized and then go forward. And therefore that flexibility in programming is required as you respond to these issues. Of course, um, there's the need to ensure that uh, we also have inbuilt uh, accountability mechanisms. For us, election of committee members are transparent. Uh, there are people who have shown good leadership roles in society and therefore very much accountable. How do we ensure that uh, we effectively support um, climate risk management? As I've said, uh, we are using climate information, the different products uh, like seasonal forecast, the weather updates, a couple of years, but our agency, the Meteorological Agency is also working to provide long-term projections to ensure that we inform the, 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 the interventions well. The other thing is that we are also building on the strength and experiences of uh, community or uh, customer institutions so that we harness on their local knowledge, local practices, and also we do things uh, in a better and coordinated manner. Of course, in the process, we have now for embedded tools and a process that, that enable that to happen, that we can harness that uh, community knowledge into the process. Of course, as we, one of the things that we've noted as we work to integrate or make use of climate information is that there's a group, the ultra poor, that are often left out of the process, more so because they don't belong to most of the networks that are being used to disseminate the information. Some of the challenges, as it has not been just uh, uh, smooth running, the one of the challenges that we've uh, actually seen or experienced is that uh, dealing with the political politicians or the leaders, which we have to do, uh, is a challenge in that uh, they would want quick and visible results. So things to do with uh, uh, hardware, hard infrastructure makes sense to them. But in certain cases, communities have prioritized things to do with uh, strengthening governance, which most people are not sometimes not happy with. So balancing that has been a challenge, but is a journey that we have to work together. Uh, Thank you of course, so much, Victor. I'll request you to wrap up now, just so that okay. we don't overrun the, the schedule. Thank you. Okay. In terms of, this is my last slide, uh, going forward, I think uh, I said that uh, we are now moving country countrywide, the 47 counties, uh, where this process is now being led by our national treasury with support of development partners, uh, as well as our government here. Uh, the only thing is that uh, for uh, most of them, we'll get both uh, uh, readiness, money to prepare the ground, put the, the necessary institutions and uh, mechanisms in place, then invest later. Two counties, uh, the Nairobi and Mombasa, which are largely cities, I uh, think are the only one excluded from the investment grants because there are a lot of other programs going on for investment. 
then uh, we see this is part of uh, mobilizing resources through our national climate fund and linking it uh, to the county climate change fund going forward so what treasury is doing now is to mobilize pool funds together at the national level under the national climate fund and then channeling it to the lower level thank you excellent thank you so much victor um that's a brilliant brilliant overview of, of another otherwise 10 year um, you know, lessons and programming on uh, county climate uh, change fund. I have a quick follow up question for you, Victor. Now, at the moment, we are experiencing hunger and starvation in some of these counties that you're talking about in this country, in Kenya. And so the question is, how has CCF been helpful and what lessons can we be able to draw to support communities when really the challenges such as lack of food and hunger and starvation becomes eminent? How can, how can such a fund be able to be useful and move quickly to be able to alleviate such problems uh, in those arid and semi-arid counties as well as the coast? We are seeing news everywhere of people really starving from lack of food. Yeah, I think uh, if you look at uh, the counties that have uh, CCF functional and those without, I think we see them doing better in terms of numbers affected uh, whether it's due to the water for livestock, water for domestic use. So I think, but we are not going to solve every problem uh, in one or two years using the CCF. I think the, the beauty with it is that uh, once we pull this together, together with the other interventions from other arms of government, then we can really deal with the different challenges and hopefully we can ensure that the numbers that are impacted or affected uh, uh, by these uh, events, uh, because leading to farmer in ETC can reduce significantly and on a more sustainable basis going forward. So we are dealing with it, but it's something that's going to be gradual, not uh, solving one or two years, but over time with sustained investment. Thank you so much. Let me not sound like uh, the politicians who want quick and uh, tangible results. As you've indicated, there are some of your challenges is people want sometimes there's need for something that is visible and quick but definitely very, very um, uh, good lessons there you've shared with us. Thank you, Victor. So I'm now going to move quickly to a video uh, from Ashila Patel. Uh, let's play that video, please, before we go to our third case study. Thank you. My name is Sheila Patel. I live and work in Mumbai with one of the affiliates of STI called Spark Mahila Milan and NSTF. Slum or Shack Dwellers International is an organization set up in 1996 with a view to develop sustained organization of grassroots groups fighting against evictions to find new ways to sort their development problems and to create visibility and citizenship in the places where they live. STI provides three kinds of financing. The first one is to provide assistance and support for sustained federation building, creating conditions for women's savings groups to learn about finance and managing settlements and giving them voice. The second one is to provide grants that provide support both technical and financial to grassroots groups to experiment and explore solutions that they can produce and that they can negotiate with their cities. And the third one is for some of the country groups to work with international organizations for research, for practical projects and other things. On behalf of SDI, we speak about the Urban Poor Funds International, which is the capital grants that we provide to grassroots groups to do projects. But all aspects of financing that SDI does is to pool resources to give communities opportunities to drive their own development. While funds for projects were given from the beginning, the concept of the Urban Poor Funds International became formalized as STI began to get specific grants 
for projects that it could deliver to communities. It went to build federation capacities, produce learning, peer learning, sharing and exchanges. What is interesting is that right from the beginning, every local community has seen this as seed funding to explore something new. And it's leveraged its own savings. It's leveraged subsidies that were available and announced by their municipality or government, but which they could not get for many reasons. But they also were able to get loans from banks and use some of the past projects as evidence to get more resources. The UPFI funds show that although they are grants, poor people treat them as seed capital and whatever resources of this they can recycle, they put back into their national urban poor funds and use it for other projects. The principle of this process is that the collective organization, the larger aggregation of SDI supports each community and absorbs much of the reputational and organizational and project risks, which are many because poor people are not able to get development because of this huge cloud of risks that everybody sees in local development. I'm just checking whether the recording has stopped um, on that side as well. Checking with the technical team, that's the end. Okay, thank you so much. That's an excellent, excellent video. I think uh, Sheila has been here with us. So in case there's any question, please do feel free to uh, drop it in the chat or in the mentee. And uh, we might just be lucky to get Sheila to respond to some of those questions. Brilliant. In the interest of time, let's move to the third case study, which is the uh, uh, Gungano Urban Poor Fund in Zimbabwe. I'd like to welcome George Masimba and Patience Mudimu to share their work. George and Patience, please take over. Hello, everyone. Hello, George, we can hear you. Uh, we can see you. We are trying to see whether this is gonna, yes, somebody is increasing the font, excellent. Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, on the Gungano Open Poor Fund. Uh, the Gungano Open Poor Fund from the Zimbabwean experience. My name is George Masimba. I work uh, with Dialogue on Shelter, which is an affiliate of the SDI. The Gungano Eben Poor Fund was set up in 1998 by Eben Poor Collectives, which are known as the Zimbabwe Homeless People's Federation. And these are grassroots con collectives that are constituted into about 612 collectives at the moment, with a membership totaling about uh, 15,000 households. The Mainly the Gungana Eben Poor Fund, it was formed as a result of the need to address issues to do with financial exclusion and deepening urban poverty that was affecting mainly uh, urban poor communities living in informal settlements or slums. So essentially these communities could not afford uh, finance from your formal institutions. And also there was rising urban poverty in our country. So in order to get around this, communities under the Zimbabwe Homeless Post Federation set up their own fund, which they own and manage. So the fund uh, addresses a number of issues, which include, for example, enabling the urban poor who are living in, in slums to access housing, uh, livelihoods, uh, undertake income generating loans, uh, 
uh, enable themselves to access uh, basic services such as water and sanitation uh, and energy and other uh, uh, important basic services. So in terms of uh, the key features of the fund or what it aims to do, the fund is, like I said earlier, it's owned and managed by the poor. And also the, the fund uh, promotes partnerships and collaboration between the urban poor and city governments. And uh, in addition to that, the, the fund also uh, seeks to establish a financing instrument that is scalable and replicable in terms of for uh, providing basic urban services to the urban poor. And also the, the manner in which the, the fund is structured or organized enables the, is, is, is such that the fund empowers the urban poor in slums by, by uh, providing them with affordable loans and also even by providing them with skills and uh, resources to undertake income, generate, in, income generating loans. And to date, the fund is managed to enable or to reach out to close to 15,000 households. And uh, in terms of fu funding, 804,000 US dollars has been mobilized through the, 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 the Gungano Urban Poor Fund. So how is the decision-making devolved in terms of the, the fund? The, urban, the Gungano Urban Poor Fund uh, is, is, is anchored on the grassroots collectives that are known, saving, that are known as uh, savings groups. So on the basis of these saving groups, the urban poor are able to make decisions in terms of uh, what it is they want to prioritize in their community or in their settlement, for example, it could be accessing a, a, a communal water point, it could be even construction of a communal sanitation block. So through that mechanism, the urban poor fund enables decentralized decision making by the urban poor themselves based on what they prioritize, based on the, their needs. Then in addition, the fund is also uh, decision-making processes are devolved in the sense that the fund is anchored on savings groups that are women-led. Uh, so largely 90% of the membership within the federation is, is constituted by women. So these are women who are leading these savings groups. And uh, on the basis of that, women make decisions about what it is that they grapple with in their communities. For example, it could be uh, access to water, uh, sanitation, energy issues, et cetera, all that. So it is these women who are leading savings groups in, in the various parts of the country in formal settlement that then make decisions that direct where the resources from the funds then go to. The fund is also the fund is also uh, working towards enabling the urban poor in informal settlements to access a uh, land tenure, even build incremental housing and transitional housing, and uh, make incremental improvements in, in the settlements in relation to provide provision of drainage systems and sanitation. So in terms of uh, decision-making, we can say that the, the Gungano Urban Poor Fund not only creates a, a financial vehicle that enables communities that are in slums to access services, but also creates a very critical space for communities to make decisions in terms of uh, providing or uh, enabling their settlements access services that are uh, in, in previously not, not there in, this, in these communities. So how and why is the uh, Gungano Urban Poor Fund a uh, business unusual? 
in other words, how are the uh, principles of locally led adaptation reflected in the, in the way in which the fund operates? As I said earlier on, the fund's decision-making uh, arrangements are devolved. Communities that are in savings groups, in, in settlements, in, in informal settlements, are the ones that sit together, make decisions in terms of what it is that they are prioritizing. And based on the needs that they, they identify, they can then make decisions in terms of whether they are going to construct a, 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 a communal sanitation block, for example. And in one of the settlements where we are working, communities have been able to construct a, or a, a develop sanitation units in the form of ecological sanitation toilets, which are your dry toilets that are functioning in areas where uh, communities do not have access to water. But because of such innovations uh, by communities themselves, they are able to access sanitation. Then secondly, the Gungano Urban Poor Fund is also focusing on addressing uh, structural inequalities. That is to say, it, focus, it, is, it has been focusing on the marginalized groups, uh, women, uh, young people, and also even focusing on slums. And uh, as you are away, slums in many of the instances do not have access to, to services because they are either uh, not part of the mainstream city or they are considered as illegal. So by having a fund that is focusing on these areas that traditionally would not have accessed uh, basic services, the fund is in a way focusing on, on, on addressing structural inequalities that affect the urban poor in cities. Then thirdly, the fund also provides a flexible and readily a, and easily accessible finance. So unlike your traditional formal uh, financial institutions where it would take very long time for people to be able to access uh, finance, assuming they even qualify to access, the fund by the fact that it's located in, 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 in these local communities, in these slum settlements, it makes it easier for communities to quickly access resources. For example, in case of uh, uh, floods, people can easily access uh, resources to quickly develop their drainage systems. Whereas uh, if they were to approach formal institutions, this would take a very protracted period while people uh, suffer from the uh, uh, hazards or shocks associated with some of the climate change issues that affect informal settlements. Then fourthly, the, the fund is also, is also been key in terms of uh, developing uh, uh, enduring structures in communities, uh, which are, are also supported by us as the local NGO that is working with the, the Federation. So essentially the fund is providing that uh, uh, capacity in communities in terms of how do they man manage finance. And that is very important in the sense that it then prepares the communities in terms of even managing the bigger loans that are associated with the infrastructure improvements that can be done in formal settlement. The Gungana Eben Poor Fund has also been a, a, a critical in terms of building robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty in that uh, it has been anchored by uh, processes of collecting data through the, the enumerations that are done and spearheaded by uh, savings groups that I talked about earlier. So that provides the information about the real issues that are affecting uh, communities in these informal settlements in terms of uh, 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 the nature of the shocks, be it uh, uh, floods, be it uh, lack of water, and even strong winds that might destroy some of the uh, sharks that you find in these informal settlements. So there's uh, a lot of information or uh, there's a lot of evidence that is built around how the fund operates in such a way that there's 
very sufficient and solid data that informs the decision making uh, for the fund in terms of where the resources are directed towards. Then uh, embedded in the way in which the fund operates also are George, issues. To George, please, please wrap up now. You have one minute to wrap up so that okay. we don't overrun the session. Thank you. Okay, so embedded in, in the way in which the fund, the fund also works is uh, issues to do with flexible programming and learning through the savings groups that I talked about earlier. Communities have got very critical spaces through which they can uh, reflect and learn on how they can continuously improve and adjust in terms of the priorities for the fund. Then uh, being located at the local level, the fund also has got some trans very key transparent and accountability mechanisms that are anchored or uh, rooted in the savings group that I talked about earlier. Then lastly, in terms of the collaborative action and investment, uh, the Gungana Urban Poor Fund has been very critical in terms of enabling, creating partnerships with city governments, collaborations that have been key in terms of influencing, not only uh, maximizing around issues of risk, financial resources, but also influencing policies that for a very long time affect communities that are in formal settlement. Then in terms of moving forward, lastly, my, my, the key issue is about how do we increase finance based on the experience that these city funds have shown across the world in terms of the SDI affiliates and also in, uh, uh, improve in terms of making sure that the policy environment enables the poor to be able to bring in these services that I have talked about. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so, so much, George. A quick follow-up question. Um, if you are to advise global climate funds and donors, what would you wish to change to shift more climate finance via a funding mechanism like yours? Sorry, Kama, can I didn't get the question? If you are to advise global climate funds and donors, what would you wish to change to shift more climate finance via a mechanism like yours? I think uh, what, what is very key is for global donors to uh, invest in these structures that have demonstrated capacity in terms of delivering solutions in, in informal settlements. So these, while well, we have done a lot in terms of uh, the experiences from the fund, this is not addressing the magnitude of the challenges that the urban poor are facing in cities. So there is need to augment, uh, provide more resources towards these uh, facilities that have been developed by the urban poor uh, over the years. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. And a quick one again before you go. Um, how is conflict in decision making managed within your, you know, your intervention within your program? Do communities vote by consensus or do they have voting rights? This is a question that was asked for all speakers, but I thought since you're speaking before I let you go, maybe you might answer that for us. How does it work in Zim? Thank you. In terms of for arriving at consensus, the, the manner in which decisions are made it's, it's through the savings group that I at the local level that I talked about earlier. This is where the uh, decision making process happens. And this is where the issues, the challenges that I've been talking about are at. So the fact that these are communities that are meeting regular on a routine basis, that element or that mechanism also helps in terms of generating consensus around priorities. That is, we, we do want a, a, a communal water point, for example. We want a water and sanitation a, a facility here in our settlement. So working together enables or builds the needed social cohesion that helps generating much needed consensus around the priorities for the fund. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. That's again, a very, very uh, interesting question, you know, uh, case there. Um, we'll now move to Namibia, where we have a case study uh, on Namibia's Environment Investment Fund. Carl Mutani Aribeb in chief is the Chief Operations Officer for EIF. Carl, please take us over through this case. Thank you so much. 
Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Susan. Thank you, colleagues. Let me try and share my screen. This is something I've not done before, so please bear with me, colleagues. Uh, share screen. Okay. Carl, if you're struggling to share your screen, you can uh, share it as Are you able to? Yes, yes please. Should we share it? If you could yep. assist, please, yeah. No problem. Thank you. You should be able to see that now on the screen. Okay. Good. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, colleagues. I'm going to share the evolving experiences of the Environmental Investment Fund of Namibia. Uh, for the benefit of uh, those participants who do not know, Namibia is a small country, small, basically only in the size of the population, but a huge uh, geographically big country on the southwestern coast of, of Namibia. Uh, we, I work for the Environmental Investment Fund, currently the only accredited entity uh, under GCF. We implement a portfolio of four uh, GCF projects, all of them adaptation projects. And I'm gonna share our evolving experiences with respect to one of the projects called Empower to Adapt. Uh, I will need assistance to get back to the first page, please. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, next page now. Uh, basically, why do we consider this project as business unusual? Is the project brings the resources directly to the rural communities to address the local level adaptation needs. It is focuses on bottom up community based natural resources governance, supporting locally led approaches to identifying practical adaptation solutions. Institutionalized capacity building makes context specific programming approaches and solutions possible. A locally led approach in both design and development of projects uh, and through monitoring and evaluation. The locally led um, community monitoring system, also an essential part of the project, uh, provides feedback loop for enhanced and effective climate change planning and adaptation management. The identified project funding windows, and this is where I need to pause for a second address critical root causes of vulnerable rural populations whose livelihood depend directly on natural resources. Namibia is an extremely, uh, as you may have read, an extremely arid country with about 60 to 70 percent of the population rurally based, bulk of which directly uh, depend on natural resources for, for their livelihood. So this uh, Funding windows were basically informed by vulnerability assessment, a national one that was undertaken that identified key adaptation options for different geographic regions. And, and the content of these three investment windows, ecosystem-based adaptation, climate-resilient agriculture, and climate proof infrastructure 
were informed by this vulnerability assessment. And colleagues will probably notice quite a bit of similarity between this and the first presentation that came from South Africa. Um, climate change impacts, creating income generating opportunity for women, youth, also contributes to addressing poverty and associated vulner vulnerabilities, basically responding to the needs that have been identified through the National Vulnerability Assessment. It is a grant-based facility that enhances accessibility to finance to local actors. As I alluded to in my introduction, the funding in this case goes directly to community-based entities, which in this case are legally registered in gazetted communal area conservancies and community forest management entities. No obligation for, for, for paying back. Uh, the difference here, why this is business unusual is that traditionally in Namibia, they were always uh, our colleagues from the civil society sector that will be in the in between providing support to the CBOs. But this project is, is one of the kind, at least in our perspective, that has broken away from that tradition and has invested directly into, into, uh, into the CBOs in this case. The CBOs that received support for, under this project were basically in three types in terms of capacity. There were those that were really capable of managing the resources that were provided to them uh, themselves. They were in the middle, the ones that needed just a little bit of limited external support by support entities of their choice. And then there were very minimal handful of them that were able to basically say, no guys, we cannot handle this uh, because of our limited capacity, literacy, remote locations would like to have a, a civil society partner help us out of our request. So that, that, that is really what made this one very unique. Uh, one of the reasons why this uh, project is also very strong in our opinion is that uh, it's not something that EIF or this GCF resources have started. The project basically capitalized on existing uh, institutional foundation that was laid by Namibia's national CPNRM program. This program has been operating since 1990s, more than 20 years by the time this project was approved. Uh, 40, 80 uh, communal area conservancies registered, over 40 communal uh, uh, forest reserves registered, which have received a lot of support and institutional development over this period. So this project basically chipped in and provided support where the investments and progress that were made uh, under the national CBNRM program were being threatened by climate change. And that is why uh, the, the local level monitoring element of this project basically also brought in monitoring the impact of climate change on already ongoing monitoring efforts that focused on tourism and, and, and biodiversity. Next slide, please. How does this project align to eight principles of uh, locally led adaptation? The design of the project is the first one that it is executed by the CBOs not only executed by plant, conceptualized and implemented by the CBOs, they are at the center of the implementation. This decision-making contributes to ownership, increased ownership actually at that, social uh, scalability and replicability of the projects and CPNRM governance, governance is enhanced. The delivery mechanism provides funding directly to CBOs, uh, as I have alluded to earlier, without the need of reliance on intermediaries. Secondly, the grant-based finance is available to the poor, climate vulnerable communities, including the poorest populations, the marginalized groups, providing income generating opportunities and improved livelihoods. The facility investment windows address the needs, and those needs, as I said earlier, informed by 
very rigorous uh, vulnerability and assessment exercise that was undertaken by the Ministry of Environment and Tourism and, and key stakeholders. Uh, the project provides grant-based finance, again, requiring no collateral, making it accessible to the vulnerable groups, including women and youth, capacity building, and I will come back to capacity building, how it became a challenge in the end. Capacity building is provided to CBOs to ensure that CBOs are equipped with uh, the necessary skills to basically conceptualize and develop projects. The capacity building is also very important that the project emphasizes climate awareness, gender training, training on proposal development and access to grant funding and development of implementation of climate investment plans and also playing an active uh, role in monitoring and evaluation as well as the re uh, meeting the reporting requirements that came uh, with the funding. Next slide, please. In addition Thank to you, providing- Kyle, 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 could I kindly request to wrap up? Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, basically maybe I'll just jump to the slide that deals with, 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 uh, with challenges. Uh, I really joined the South African colleague with the challenges uh, that, uh, that she listed, but we have our own unique challenges. The first one was the underestimation of, not on our part, but on the part of the colleagues from the GCF of the need of capacity building. It was considered as non-climate change and as a result, not adequately capitalized. That was the biggest uh, uh, challenge and also the expectations and dealing with the political stakeholders as the colleague from Zimbabwe has also, and Kenya also have outlined. Uh, but from that, there were also a host of opportunities uh, in this respect. We built on an existing foundation, institutional foundation of the National CBNRM program. Uh, and then also we found ready-made institutional capacity on the ground, which we have added through this project. So basically taking the resources directly to where the, uh, the, the needs are experienced on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Carl. Um, you have preempted my question in terms of some of the challenges. And so I'll not go into a follow-up question because you definitely preempted that. What I'd like to do is to just, I know we are right, running out of time. We are right on the hour. And so quickly, uh, the, ask the three panelists quickly to give us one last comment in half a minute, or even if possible, a quarter of a minute, 15 seconds, in terms of what you would like us to take as a key takeaway message today. So with the panelists starting from South Africa, Tami, and then Kenya, and Namibia, and uh, please, let's just get your key, unmute yourself, Put yourself on the video and just like the way you presented, give us your last key takeaway shot, the parting shot. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Susan. I'll be brief. I think that my departing comments that I haven't yet said is that I think we're keen to work with donors um, and uh, international aid institutions to sort out the best way to ensure funding gets to the most vulnerable people and has the greatest impact. I think key in that discussion is really looking at risk because the, we need to ensure that the communities don't bear the brunt of the administrative and um, sometimes onerous requirements to receive grants. And so we need to work out systems and ways of working together to ensure that the, the money does get to where it needs to go and has the greatest impact. And then finally, we just to underscore, I think the primary message here, which is we desperately need additional accelerated increased funding for adaptation. We are not at a point as we understand, particularly after the last IPCC report, we, mitigation options will not alone be able to um, address the challenges that are going to be faced, particularly in Africa. And so I'll just end with that call to action. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Tammy. Quickly over to you, George. And I'm looking whether Victor is going to unmute himself and put himself on video. So George, quickly in half, in 15 seconds. 
Thank you, Susan. My parting shot would be that the urban poor funds that are SDI have shown that uh, the urban poor in informal settlements uh, over the years have developed very uh, effective funds with robust systems that can be scaled up only and if more resources are put into these funds. Thank you. Thank you, George. Victor? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to echo some of the comments that uh, we would need uh, patient, uh, predictable, and of course, uh, of uh, uh, higher, you know, higher scale of funding to ensure that we can deal with some of these challenges. The demands are huge and uh, we are not going to solve them overnight. So we need uh, that predictability, that consistency, and uh, at such a scale that uh, we can deal with these challenges on a more sustainable basis. Thank you, Victor. And Carl, your parting shot? Yes, my parting shot would be basically, I would echo the, the, the sentiments from South Africa about the transaction cost at the local level. The, in our case, the GCF, uh, limit on 5%, 8% is really not very helpful. So creative thinking is required for locally funding, uh, uh, co-financing uh, opportunities to support this gap. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Vic. thank you, Carl. And everyone, I want to thank everyone, our participants, our speakers, our keynote address, the organizers of this session. This has been extremely good questions, extremely rich discussion and crucial on locally led adaptation and how we can make sure that local communities and partners on the front lines of climate impacts have access to finance, decision-making power to invest in their own adaptation priorities and build their own resilience. Unfortunately, our time is up for today, but the conversation certainly continues. We hope you can join our next dialogue where we will have the opportunity to further drill down into what's needed and what can we can do together to scale up finance and support locally led adaptation, as well as, as address some of the amazing questions that we received today and we were not able to answer. There were lots in the Mentimeter in the chat. We do recognize them, we'll take them and we'll factor them into the next dialogue. We have a quick Zoom poll, which will invite you to complete we do hope that you are interested to continue on this journey with us. Thank you to our speakers once more, our panelists, and to all of you, our participants, for really an engaging session. We hope to see you again on October 12th for the second regional dialogue on scaling up locally-led adaptation in Africa. Until then, Godspeed. See you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>